Energy is actually really important in chemistry because energy tells us a lot about chemical reactions. When we look at a chemical reaction and the energy associated with it, that information can tell us whether the reaction will happen at all, if it does happen, how fast it will happen, and what products are likely to form from the reaction. Whether we're talking about it in chemistry or whether we're talking about energy in our day-to-day -day lives, we usually are talking about the general idea of doing work. So when we say energy in our day-to-day -day lives, we usually mean the energy to power a car or run a light bulb, or maybe just the energy to get up in the morning and do some work. In chemistry, it really means the same thing, except that work is going to be done by molecules. There's two different forms of energy that we'll run into. The first is what's called potential energy. Potential energy, like the name implies, is really the potential for something to happen. So potential energy can be thought of stored energy, like a battery stores energy. The other type of energy is called kinetic energy. And again, like the name implies, this is the energy of motion. So when molecules are in motion, they have kinetic energy. Energy can change back and forth between potential and kinetic energy, but much like matter, it can't be made and it can't disappear. So we'll see that energy is always changing from potential to kinetic and back and forth during all types of processes, including chemical reactions. One simple way to remember the difference between potential and kinetic energy is just to picture a car sitting on top of a hill. If that car is perched very close to this edge of the hill, but it's not moving, we would say it has a large potential energy. The reason is the potential for the car to roll down the hill is very, very high. Once the car did start to roll down the hill, it would be in motion. So that large potential energy would at least partially transfer into kinetic energy. That's the kinetic energy of the car moving, of the car moving molecules of air around it, of the friction on the tires, and many other aspects to motion. Eventually, the car would get to the bottom of the hill and stop moving. And when it did that, we'd be back where it has potential energy but now it would have a much smaller amount of potential energy. In a lot of ways, like a battery, it used up some of its energy on that hill by changing it into other forms. Now in chemical reactions, we're unlikely to see molecules just rolling down a hill. Most of the time, the energy in chemical reactions really has to do with heat, and in particular, whether that heat is being given off by the reaction or absorbed by the reaction. So for that reason, you can use the term energy in chemistry, but you're a lot more likely to run into the term enthalpy. Enthalpy comes from the idea of heat energy, and that's why it's actually symbolized with a capital H. Most of the time in chemistry, it's okay to use these terms interchangeably. Only in very specific applications is it important to differentiate between them. So again, you can say energy or enthalpy, and they'll both be acceptable in this class. Again, the reason that this is so important has to do with how energy relates to chemical reactions. And in all chemical reactions, we know that we have molecules, and those molecules have bonds that keep the different atoms connected together. Think about those bonds as essentially being springs. They're springs that are loaded up with potential energy. And in fact, that's how molecules store energy, is in their chemical bonds. Let's look at a really simple example. The single covalent bond that forms between two chlorine atoms is an example of a bond that has energy stored in it. Now just by looking at it, I can't tell anything about the amount of energy in it, but if I were to measure it in a laboratory or look this up in a piece of literature, I'd find that there's actually an energy associated with that particular bond. We call this the bond energy. And the bond energy for a chlorine-chlorine single bond is about 58 kilocalories per mole of those bonds. There's two ways to think about this bond energy. The easiest way, I think, to picture it is just to imagine that that bond energy, 58 kilocalories per mole, is the amount of energy that's required to break the bond. Or in other words, it's the cost of what you would have to put into that bond in order to break it. So those two chlorine atoms have formed a covalent bond to become more stable, and if you want to energetically convince them to separate, you're going to have to put some energy into that. 
just like you'd have to put energy into breaking a string or a band that held two things together. So the bond energy, or the energy required to break this bond, is 58 kilocalories per mole. That's the cost of breaking the bond. However, this can actually go two ways. While it requires 58 kilocalories to break a mole of these bonds, if you form one mole of these bonds, you will actually get paid 58 kilocalories. So it goes both ways. Bond energy is the energy required to break a bond, but it's also the energy released when the bond forms. The way we can tell the difference when it's written down is whether there's a positive or a negative value. A positive value, much like on your bank statement, means a cost of something. So it requires 58 kilocalories per mole to break these bonds. If we see a negative number, that's a li little bit like a credit on your bank statement. Negative 58 kilocalories per mole would mean 58 kilocalories were released. And again, that's what happens when this bond forms. The only thing you can tell about a bond just when it's drawn on paper is you can make an educated guess about the magnitude of its bond energy, but you won't know it specifically. For example, let's compare this chlorine-chlorine single bond to a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. Which do you think is harder to break, a triple bond or a single bond? Well, hopefully you said it's harder to break a triple bond. So for that reason, we'd require it to cost us more energy. And in fact, if I go to the literature or I do an experiment in the laboratory, I can find out that the bond energy of a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is 226 kilocalories per mole of bonds. So again, it's larger than the bond energy of that chlorine-chlorine single bond. And that's pretty normal for triple bonds to have a higher bond energy than a single bond or even a double bond. But remember, this still means it requires 226 kilocalories of energy to break a mole of these triple bonds. Or if you form a mole of those bonds, you'll actually get 226 kilocalories out of that process or released from that process. And that's really where we get into the idea that chemical reactions have a great deal of energy associated with them. Because if you think about it, in a chemical reaction, we don't just make one bond or break one bond. We usually have a lot of different bonds to consider. In all chemical reactions, we know that we start with reactants and we end with products. And in specific chemical reactions, we might have one or two or three reactants, maybe even more. And same thing with the products. We might have one or two or three of them. But the fact is, all of those reactants are going to be broken apart into atoms, which then get rearranged and put together differently in the products. So whenever you start a chemical reaction, the first piece of energy that's required is the energy that you need to break apart all the atoms in the reactants. So you always require energy at the beginning of a reaction just to break apart those atoms. Once you have the atoms broken apart, they can then reform or form new products. And when you do that, you make brand new bonds. As we just saw, when you form a bond, that actually releases energy or gives you energy. So there's a net process here. First you put in energy, it's like an investment, and then you get out energy from that process. You put in energy to break the bonds, and then you get out energy when you form new bonds. As you can imagine, this is just like any investment. You always need a little money to get started, but we always think of a good investment as one where you get back more than what you put in. And this is exactly what we have to consider in chemistry. If I have to put in energy to break up those reactants' atoms, and then I'm going to get back energy when I make new products, usually it's a good thing if I get back more energy than I put in. But it goes both ways. In some cases, you'll have reactions that require more energy than you actually get out of them. And these are what are called endothermic reactions. Endo, or into, means you have to put heat into the reaction. That's where we get the term endothermic. Now, you'll always have to put some heat into reactions, as we'll see in a couple minutes. But endothermic means you put more heat or you put more energy into this reaction than you get out.
Another way to think about it is because you have to put energy into the reaction, energy really is a reactant here. It's something you have to put into the reaction to get it going. So energy or heat is a reactant in an endothermic reaction. Numerically, if we look at the individual bond energies for all the reactants and all the products and we calculate the difference, we would see that the difference in enthalpy in an endothermic reaction is actually a positive value. And we could go through and do this in, in entirety. We could actually calculate this out for an entire chemical reaction. But right now it's just important to realize that the delta H or the difference in enthalpy will be positive for endothermic reactions. Because that's usually the way that the information will be given to you in literature. It's the fastest way to get that information. So that might be thought of as a bad investment. An endothermic reaction is one where you put energy in to break up the reactants and then you don't get all the energy back when you get the new products out of the reaction. A better type of investment, if you want to continue to think about it that way, would be what's called an exothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction is any chemical reaction that releases more energy than you had to put into it, or more energy than it required. So exo, of course, means outside of, like an exoskeleton. So exothermic means energy or heat comes out of the reaction. And another way to think about that would be to think of heat as a product of this reaction. You put a little bit of energy in, but you get a lot of energy out. So you've essentially made heat, although we know that you're really just releasing it. So heat's a product, and if you were to look up the delta H, or the change in enthalpy for an exothermic reaction, you'd see that it's a negative value. So all chemical reactions are either endothermic or exothermic reactions because you always have to put energy in, but it's a question of how much energy do you get back out when you form those new products. The delta H value is probably the most important aspect to endo and exothermic reactions because in addition to telling you whether a reaction is endo or exothermic, it can also be used in calculations that tell us about the amount of energy involved. This can be used for any type of chemical reaction, so let's look at one that's relevant to the human body. Your body is able to metabolize all types of carbohydrates, but one of the simplest ones is actually glucose, which has the chemical formula C6H12O6. And when your body metabolizes glucose, it actually releases 686 kilocalories of energy. The chemical reaction that allows us to do this is written below. Here's one glucose molecule which reacts with six molecules of oxygen and produces six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. Again, your body doesn't do this just to produce carbon dioxide and water, it does this because metabolism also releases energy. When we look at this information, we see that the delta H of the reaction is negative. The negative sign indicates this is an exothermic reaction. Or in other words, energy is released by this reaction. And I can basically think of this then as a product of the reaction. So the negative 686 kilocalories really just means that 686 kilocalories of energy are released during this reaction. And in fact, I'm going to actually write that into the equation so that I remember that heat or energy is just a product of this reaction. Notice I don't write the negative sign when I put it into the equation because the negative simply tells me that the 686 kilocalories is a product of the reaction. Or in other words, it should be written on the right side. Now that I know this, I can answer some pretty basic questions. Let's say you eat something like a Snickers bar, which might have about 31 grams of glucose in it. Let's calculate the amount of energy that's released when your body metabolizes 31 grams of glucose according to this chemical reaction. The way we're going to handle this is the same way we've handled all calculations that involve balanced chemical reactions, and that's to use our stoichiometric calculations. So I'm going to start out by saying that I have 31.0 grams of glucose. And in order to relate that to the information given in the balanced equation, I know that I can't be in grams, I have to change to moles. Glucose, which has the chemical formula C6H12O6, 
has a molecular weight of 180 grams, again, this is glucose, for every one mole of glucose. So we start out just like a typical stoichiometric calculation. I change from grams to moles, and now I can use the balanced equation to relate moles of glucose to anything else I want. If the question had asked, calculate the amount of oxygen you require or the amount of carbon dioxide you produce, I could do that using the three-step process we did in chapter six, grams to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams. But instead, I'm gonna use this to calculate the amount of energy that's produced. Again, during this step, I'm just gonna look at the balanced equation. According to the balanced equation, one mole of glucose, one mole of glucose, will, will produce 686 kilocalories of energy. And I'm just reading that off the balanced equation. So I get my calculator out, I multiply 31 times 686, and I divide it by the molecular weight, which was 180. And I see that I'll produce about 118 kilocalories of energy. So if you eat 31 grams of glucose and your body metabolizes it perfectly with 100% yield from this equation and this reaction, you'll produce 118 kilocalories of energy, or in other words, 118 food calories. As you can see, knowing the amount of energy associated with a reaction can be just as important as knowing the chemicals that are involved in a reaction, especially when energy is so important for so many of the processes in the human body. Still, even if we understand the energy that's coming in or going out of a reaction, we still have overlooked one thing, and that's why do chemical reactions happen at all? So why can I mix together certain substances and get a beautiful change in colors, or a precipitate, or a neutralization reaction, whereas other substances I mix together and nothing happens? The reason lies in a lot of different aspects of energy. And that's really where we get into the study of thermodynamics, or in other words, the energy dynamics of chemical reactions. Let's look at an example. This is the chemical reaction that summarizes what happens when octane is combusted in the presence of oxygen. Octane is one of the major components of gasoline. So C8H18, you can just think about that as gasoline for an automobile. It reacts with 25 molecules of oxygen from the atmosphere, and it produces 16 molecules of carbon dioxide gas and 18 molecules of H2O, usually in the form of water vapor. As we've said at the beginning of this quarter, the reason you do this reaction in your car is not to produce carbon dioxide and water, but to produce energy. And we can see that the delta H of this reaction is negative 2,634 kilocalories, or in other words, Every time you run this reaction as written, you produce or you release 2,634 kilocalories of energy. So on the left side, our reactants are really just gasoline and oxygen from the air around us. And on the right side, we have carbon dioxide, water, the stuff involved in car exhaust, plus the energy that's released. So why is it that you can mix gasoline and oxygen together to make energy but I can't run this reaction perfectly backwards, meaning I can't exhale carbon dioxide into a glass of water and remake octane gas. That would be nice, but it doesn't work that way. There's really three factors for why this reaction happens the way it does, and they're the same three factors that dictate every chemical reaction. So again, why can I heat up some raw eggs and make a wonderful omelet but I can't cool the omelet back down and make raw eggs again. We know that's a chemical reaction, but why is it a chemical reaction that works the way it does? Those three factors, the first one is the one we've just seen, the enthalpy, or in other words, the heat that's either absorbed or released during the reaction. There are two other factors that we'll look at as well. One is something called entropy, which is a measure of disorder in the reaction, and the third is what's called activation energy, or the energy that's required to actually activate or get a reaction going. Let's look at entropy and activation energy in more detail. Entropy is a little bit of an odd topic because it's actually a way of measuring the amount of disorder or chaos in any system or any substance. 
It's symbolized by a capital S, and it's easiest to think about this just on a very conceptual level. You already have some basic understanding of the concept of chaos. You know what chaos looks like. Something like a perfectly put together glass would have a small amount of chaos associated with it compared to that glass after it's broken. And we can actually measure the amount of disorder or the amount of chaos associated with these two things. Now the number itself might not be that important, but often we like to compare. So we'd look at the glass and say, this has a small amount of disorder or a small entropy, a small S value. Whereas the broken glass has a larger amount of disorder or a large S value associated with it. Now why is this important in chemistry? Well, consider this. If I take this glass up to the third floor of the science building here at SCC and I throw it out the window onto the pavement below, what's going to happen to the glass? Well, it'll probably shatter unless it's a really, really, really thickly made glass. So when it shatters, it breaks into smaller pieces of glass. And that's something we've all seen and we all have known since we were very small. But now imagine this. What if I take those pieces of broken glass and I carry them back up the two flights of stairs to the third floor and I go back outside and I throw those pieces of glass down onto the pavement again? What's going to happen? Most likely it's going to break into even smaller pieces of glass. What we don't expect to happen is that the original glass itself, meaning the original wine glass or whatever it was, is going to reform. We expect that chaos always increases or disorder always increases. And that's where you may have actually heard this phrase, the universe favors chaos or the universe favors disorder. It's true when you think about breaking glassware. It's true when you think about your laundry, which starts out perfectly folded and ends up in a chaotic pile probably on the floor. But it's also true in molecular reactions. Any process where we go from having something fairly ordered to fairly disordered is one where we would say that the entropy has increased. Or in other words, there's a positive delta S, a positive change in the amount of entropy. And like I just mentioned, most of the time, the universe favors increases in disorder. There's not a lot of times where everything falls neatly into place. Most of the time, the opposite happens. If you pile something up into perfect little piles and then a gust of wind comes by, it doesn't better organize those piles. It would mess the piles up. So that's a major, major concept in the universe that affects our chemical reactions. Now in chemical reactions, we have to figure out how to look at the disorder of a reaction because it's not going to be as simple as one piece of glass versus a lot of broken glass. But we can look at pieces. That's one way to think about it. So one aspect of entropy in molecular reactions is to look at the number of molecules that are involved. The universe actually favors processes where you increase the number of molecules. So it's fairly unlikely that you would see 10 different molecules combined together in a chemical reaction to form one product. That's very unlikely. But there are a lot of reactions where one or two molecules might chemically react to form five or six or 10 different products. Because again, that's an increase in disorder. Another way that molecules can experience an increase in disorder or an increase in entropy is by changing their physical states. When we look at the reactants and the products in a chemical reaction, we see that an increase in disorder or a positive delta S has occurred when we see physical states change from less energetic to more energetic. So we know solid is the least energetic of the physical states that we've looked at this quarter and gas is the most energetic. The universe actually favors reactions where you start out with something in its solid form or liquid form and change it into a gas form because gas molecules are moving very quickly and they have a lot more entropy or disorder associated with them. So not only do we have to consider enthalpy, which is the heat of reactions, we also have to consider entropy or the chaos of a reaction. And finally, the last aspect or the last factor we have to look at in chemical reactions is what's called activation energy. All reactions, no matter what they are, require some amount of activation energy. And that's literally just the energy that's required to get a reaction going. 
The reason all reactions require some amount of energy to get them started is that initially, if you think back to a couple minutes ago, we said the first thing that happens is you have to break up the reactants. You have to change them from the reactants all bonded together to a bunch of atoms that are ready to form your product molecules. So activation energy is really just the energy to go ahead and start breaking up your reactants. It's really required to start any reaction. If we think about the combustion of octane, or in other words, burning gasoline, you know that gasoline burns in your car after you ignite it. That's why you have to turn on the ignition to your car before you can do anything. Just the same reason that you know it's safe to pump gasoline as long as you're not lighting something or smoking or doing something that involves sparks near the gasoline. And the reason is this chemical reaction will not proceed from reactants to products unless there's a spark or something to start it going. That's the activation energy. So if you're talking about gasoline as a liquid, we know we don't want to put any flame near it unless we're doing this to get energy out of it. And that's why your car requires a spark plug. The spark plug provides that little bit of energy to break up the octane and oxygen molecules and then they can go ahead and form the products. The interesting aspect to activation energy is not just that every reaction requires them, but that it varies a lot from reaction to reaction. Some reactions will have a very large activation energy, or in other words, a very large cost of starting them, while others will have a smaller cost. And in fact, we can actually change the extent of the activation energy by doing things like adding a catalyst. When you add a catalyst, which is any other chemical that's going to help the reaction happen, you actually can decrease the size of the activation energy for a reaction. And we'll see that again in a couple minutes. Anytime we can decrease the activation energy of a reaction, not only is the reaction easier to start, but if you take an entire collection of molecules that are trying to do that reaction as a whole, they will go to the product or they'll complete the reaction a lot faster if you can lower the activation energy. So activation energy is the amount of energy required to start a reaction, and the smaller the activation energy is, the faster we'll see that reaction proceed to completion. Now that we know all three of the factors that are considered, we can look again at this question of why do chemical reactions occur at all? Why does octane combine with oxygen to release energy, make carbon dioxide and water, but I can't just exhale carbon dioxide into water and go back to having the original octane? The three factors that we've seen are enthalpy, entropy, and activation energy, but we actually have to look at them all together to figure out whether a reaction will happen. The activation energy is probably the easiest concept, and because enthalpy and entropy are still pretty conceptual, they're a little bit hard to pin down, a lot of times we just combine them into one factor that's called the Gibbs free energy. So the Gibbs free energy of a reaction, or the free energy as your textbook refers to it, is really just the energy of a reaction that takes into account enthalpy and entropy at the same time. And the nice thing about it is it's a really simple concept and it's just a simple subtraction that allows you to draw a conclusion. So the Gibbs free energy or the delta G of a reaction can be found simply by taking the enthalpy data, the delta H, and subtracting the temperature times the entropy value or delta S. So it's really just the enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy. When you do that, you'll get a calculated value for the delta G. And all that we usually care about, especially just in this class, is whether that delta G value is positive or negative. What we look for in most chemical reactions, if they're going to occur at all, is we're looking for a negative delta G value. A negative delta G value, or if you calculate it and you get a negative value from this calculation, means that the reaction, as long as you get it started, as long as you provide the activation energy, will continue on its own. This is also called an exergonic reaction. It releases Gibbs energy from the reaction. And in science, we actually call this a spontaneous reaction. In this case, spontaneous has a really different meaning from how we use the term spontaneous in our day-to-day -day lives. 
usually when you think of the word spontaneous, you think of something just happening, like spontaneous combustion or saying you have a spontaneous personality or a spontaneous outburst. But that's not actually what it means in science. In particularly in chemistry, spontaneous means once something starts, it'll keep going on its own. So it still requires that spark or that activation energy to get it going. So for a chemical reaction to occur at all, it always requires some activation energy. And then whether it'll keep going or not is really told by the Gibbs free energy. If it's negative, if you have a negative delta G, that guarantees the reaction will keep going on its own. Let's look at a specific example that'll hopefully help you understand these concepts better. The most important thing in most chemical reactions is determining whether they're spontaneous or not spontaneous because it's usually pretty important to know if I start a reaction, will it continue to go on its own or do I need to provide it with some additional energy? So let's find out for a particular reaction whether it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous at room temperature. We usually assume room temperature is around 298 Kelvin. The reaction we're going to consider is this one two molecules of hydrogen gas reacting with one molecule of oxygen gas to make two molecules of water in its gaseous form. This reaction is the reaction that powers hydrogen fuel cells, which are used in some vehicles, as well as the reaction that powers the space shuttle. When the space shuttle takes off to head to orbit, that large orange fuel tank on the bottom of the shuttle actually contains liquefied hydrogen and liquefied oxygen that are combined in this reaction. In order to figure out whether this is a spontaneous or non-spontaneous reaction, let's first reason out what we know about its enthalpy and entropy. So let's look at the delta H and the delta S without having any numbers in front of us and then see if we need to resort to math to figure it out. Again, when we look at the delta H and the delta S, there's a couple things to consider. First of all, we can't absolutely know either of these values unless we're actually going to do an experiment or we look it up in the literature. But we often can reason out whether the value should be positive or negative. So let's try to do that. Let's look at the delta H for this reaction. Now it hasn't been given to us, but based on the fact that this is a fuel reaction or a reaction that's used to release energy, I would probably guess that this has a negative delta H. And again, the reason is a negative delta H or an exothermic reaction will release energy. And that's true of all fuel reactions. So I'm going to reason that it's a negative delta H. In other words, an exothermic reaction. And we know that exothermic reactions in nature are favorable because in other words, in nature, all you'd have to do is get this reaction started and it would actually release or generate its own heat or its own energy. So a negative delta H is much more favorable in nature than a positive delta H. Now let's consider the delta S. Remember that entropy changes, whether they increase or decrease, depend on two things in chemical reactions. One is the physical state of the molecules and the other is the number of molecules involved in the reaction. The physical states in this reaction are two gases on the reactant side and one gas on the product side. So since all my physical states are gases, that's not terribly helpful. However, when I look at the number of molecules, I notice something interesting. On the left side of the reaction, I have two molecules of H2 and one molecule of O2 for a grand total of three molecules. But on the product side, I only have two molecules of H2O. So I've gone from having three molecules at the start of this reaction to just two molecules. Do you think that's a positive delta S, an increase in entropy? Or do you think that's a negative delta S, a decrease in entropy? Well, when you go from having three pieces of something down to just two, that's actually less disorder. Things have become more ordered. So because I've become less disordered or less chaotic, this reaction sure looks like it's going to have a negative delta S. In other words, there was a decrease in entropy, a decrease in disorder. When I think about that, that's not real favorable in nature. We know nature tends to favor disorder. So this is an unfavorable discovery. It's a bad thing because it means this reaction probably doesn't want to happen on its own. So is this reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous? 
Well, my delta H is favorable, but my delta S is not favorable. So in other words, I still don't know because I have two competing factors. One is favorable and the other is unfavorable. So at this point, I'm going to actually need the numbers to figure this out, and I'll be able to use those numbers to calculate the delta G and draw my conclusions. The numerical data for this information can be found either by doing an experiment or simply looking it up in some well-established scientific literature. When I do that, I find that the delta H for this reaction is actually 855 kilojoules. And it's a negative 855 kilojoules, which is what I predicted. All fuel reactions tend to be exothermic because they release energy. And I see that with the fact that this is negative 855 kilojoules. My delta S, again, is something that I can look up in the literature. And I would find that the decrease in entropy is, in fact, a negative decrease in entropy. And the value is 0 0.32 kilojoules per Kelvin. Again, we could never determine that number just by looking at things, but we were right in anticipating that the delta S was going to be negative. Now, to determine whether it's spontaneous or not, I need to sob solve the Gibbs free energy equation, which is delta H minus the temperature times the change in enthalpy. Now, I'm going to plug in my values. It's negative 855 kilojoules. That's my delta H. I'm going to subtract that from the temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, multiplied times the entropy, which is negative 0.32 kilojoules per Kelvin. Notice those strange units cancel here. So my kilojoules per Kelvin nicely cancels with the kilojoules in the temperature. And I end up with negative 855 kilojoules minus 298 times negative 0.32. And when I do the math, my final answer is about negative 760 kilojoules. So my delta G here is negative 660, pardon me, negative 760 kilojoules. And the most important part of that is the negative sign. The fact that this is negative means I have a spontaneous reaction. And hopefully we could have anticipated that because if the space shuttle's reaction was not spontaneous, it would be pretty hard to launch the space shuttle. But now you can see both how we reason that out as well as where the numbers actually plug into the equation. So this is an example of using the Gibbs free energy calculation to determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not spontaneous. There is a lot of information in thermodynamics, and because so much of it is numerical and involves positives, negatives, and different magnitudes of numbers, it can be really nice to just use some visual representations of this information. So very commonly, we can draw what's called a reaction diagram that describes all this different information at once. A reaction diagram is really just a chart or a graph. On the y-axis, we usually label something like energy, often the Gibbs free energy. And on the x-axis, we have our reaction, or the time. Meaning as you start on the left side, you're at the beginning of the reaction. And as you move across to the right side, you're at the end of the reaction. Now we've seen several different types of reactions so far in Chapter 7. All of them start with reactants and end with products. However, the difference between them is how much energy is involved. Let's look first at a reaction where you start with reactants that have a certain amount of energy, and let's say you end with products that have less energy. So this is a reaction where you had more energy in the bonds of your reactants than you have in the bonds of your products. This type of reaction, as you start at reactants and go to products, like all reactions, requires some activation energy. So rather than going straight from reactants to products, we usually see a little bit of a hump. That hump is the activation energy. It's how much energy did I have to put into this reaction to get it going. And then after we go over the hump, or we've surmounted the activation energy barrier, we go to the products. Because my products are lower in energy than my reactants, you can think of energy as having been released from this reaction. Or in other words, this is a downhill reaction. This is what would be an example of an exergonic reaction. We have a release in energy, or a negative value, and negative delta G, so we see it as a downhill reaction on the graph. 
there's many different ways that this graph can vary. My reactants and products can be closer or further apart. That would be their difference in energy. My activation energy can also change. I could do the exact same reaction, start with the same reactants and start with the same products, but have a lower activation energy or a lower energy barrier for the reaction. This is often accomplished simply by doing the reaction with a catalyst. So here we see the same reaction with a lower activation energy. It would be a faster reaction, and this is accomplished by adding something like a catalyst. Again, a catalyst is any chemical you add that doesn't actually react, but it helps the molecules go through the reaction more easily. In a lot of ways, it's sort of like the guy on the football team who holds the football for the kicker. By setting that ball in exactly the right place, it's that much easier for the kicker to get it. And a lot of catalysts are actually physical holding molecules that hold two molecules into position to allow them to react. So adding a catalyst will always lower the activation energy. It doesn't change the reactants or the products. It's not actually changed itself, but it does give you a faster reaction. Now whether we're looking at the blue line or the green line, these are still both exergonic or downhill reactions because in the end you've released energy and your products are in lower in energy than your reactants. The opposite type or the unfavorable type is an endergonic reaction. An endergonic reaction is any reaction where you start with reactants that have a certain amount of potential energy in the bonds and you end with react or pardon you end with products that have even more energy. So we can visually represent this information. Just remember downhill reactions allow energy to be released. Uphill reactions or endergonic reactions require the input of energy the whole time.